explain all about that. All right. Yeah, thanks for being here to my talk, which is about uh, the short update about what we did in the Vermont project uh, during the last year. Um, and one of the facts uh, you might wonder uh, that the fact you want to Linux, not a good lawyer, right? In the end, that's usually what, what people want to do, and if, if that's a customer case, uh, we are finished here. You can just ask questions and we end this talk here. Um, but in reality, there are some other things you need to take care of. And some other constraints in usual embedded projects um, must say that we are more or less working on uh, embedded industrial uh, no, devices, products, not so much on phones and, and other things you might want to associate with embedded Linux. Our devices are most times things like machine controllers, uh, even uh, machine interface devices and things like that. And in, in that uh, area, there are a lot of interesting use cases where the bootloader plays quite an important role. Um, and I will talk about uh, those use cases a little later. Um, for those of you who have worked with DevOps before and don't know the bootloader yet, uh, I have a short introduction about what we are doing there, how it feels like, um, what, what the basic uh, well, look and feel of the command line is and what is there. Uh, one of the main things we added during the last year is the free desktop of the bootloader specification and uh, support for bootloader devices. And uh, finally, uh, some like features like marketing support, properties, and in the end, some uh, question and answer methods, hopefully, so I start to use this here. Um, so, what we basically do with the bootloader is that the first thing we're doing is a new bootloader hardware initialization. The CPU comes out of the reset, and you need to initialize some things like the memory, the flash, the PLS, the clocks, and all these things. And after doing that, the, the second thing is that you need to fetch the kernel from them from somewhere. And this is a uh, way you can find out about boot medium, which can be any of, of, of these here, depending on your use case and on your actual hardware. And when you fetch the kernel from, from the boot medium, you just uh, fall into the kernel and start it. And uh, from there, an embedded Linux system is more or less like uh, any other Linux system where the kernel starts and all the routes and this kind of things. On an embedded device, uh, you quite often have the use case that you need to present a nice flash screen, like here, uh, somewhere in the hardware initialization when you are up and running and have the graphics uh, running. Then you need to show a flash screen here, and when you fetch a kernel in the background, and you don't want to have it flickering or blinking or anything like that. And the other things. Oh, when everything is uh, finished here, then you just fall into the application and the application starts and takes over. So that you just switch on, have this test screen, and then it moves on to the application. I have a short demo here, a short uh, video. No, here. No, that works. Yeah. And you can see when it's at zero, we switch on. On the left side, you see the serial console of the device, and here you see the flash screen, and then five seconds after power on, uh, the, the main application, this QT application, takes over. And you see that uh, the login, I will show it again, the login comes even some seconds after the application is already working. So at zero, it is starting, switching on, console, bootloader, flash screen, new starting, so to be application running, and then. Over there, you can see that the last of seconds, the login comes to the console. So this is basically how such a device uh, works. What you're seeing here is a 500 megahertz uh, ARM 11, and it's uh, 35 uh, from Freescale in a real uh, customer device in that case here. And this is basically one of our scenarios we have here. Another uh, use case we have is that uh, when the hardware initialization is done here, we, in, in some cases we have a decision point here in the bootloader where we need to decide if we boot one of two different load desktops. Like for example, if 
you're normally running from here and you're doing a complete image update of your system in field, uh, even without network connection or even without permanent network connection, you download an image or a data image, uh, you, you put it into the second filter slot and then you just put the other one, for example. Uh, or another scenario, uh, another use case is um, that this might even be more than one filter slot, filter A, filter B for updates. And if something fails, if something goes wrong with the main uh, control application or something like that, then you might just decide to go into some factory default or into some emergency Linux which just shows in uh, the flash screen which says, uh, well, contact the service uh, technician or something like that. So deciding between different filter uh, slots is an important thing. And in most cases, this really needs to be done uh, with the root loader because all the rest of the system can be exchanged uh, during uh, the further update. So the next thing is a uh, sort of short introduction uh, to the demos. When we need four demos from u back in 2007, there have been a lot of things with u we have not been really happy with. And uh, basically it was that, that u is, is very much uh, written in a microcontroller-like fashion. You have a lot of configure, a uh, lot of um, defines where you can do things on compile time, and you have a lot of things which are really different from what we have learned in the Linux kernel during the last 10 years or so. But the Linux kernel brought up a lot of new good ideas about how to write C code, how to make it well tested, how to uh, well do things in a really good way. And we tried to put up these good ideas uh, and take them from Linux and bring them into the bootloader space. Another iteration was uh, POSIX. When we first started with DevOps, we thought that there are a lot of things which, which could be more POSIX-like, like a like, uh, normal command line or all these things. You know. And uh, when we tried that, it really helped a lot. And uh, we got rid of a lot of strange things uh, in the new boot, which made a lot of problems uh, during, well, because we're during half hour. I could bring up something we, we do in our daytime job, uh, so we new, new hardware on our desk which never run Linux before, and then trying to make everything work when we don't know if the hardware works actually. Uh, this is something where the is plays an important role. Um, frameworks is pretty important. If you remember uh, the old Linux 2.4, there have been a lot of drivers who just implemented interfaces. And today in Linux we have frameworks and mid layers in there which implement the interface and have an internal API. Uh, and uh, that's something we do in DevOps uh, quite often. File <coughs> systems is also something uh, we have in DevOps these days. Uh, we just borrowed the K-Pool, the k contact frameworks from, from Linux, which gave us parallel uh, combination. Uh, quite easily and all these things. Um, we have a standard shell, one of the busy box shells uh, where, you, where you can use commands like copy, rm, ls, and all these things. Uh, we have real scripting, and so basically the idea is to get best of U-Boot and Linux and mix that together and still do it bootloader way without interrupts, without having things in parallel and uh, these. So here is a typical startup from Bandbox, so it looks like you get a banner here and some messages about hardware stuff and then this typical <coughs> countdown here, even that the script in, in Bandbox can be thrown away, you can do it differently and all these things and then we get a command line and can do things here. Um, we have our file systems, uh, basically the RAM file system which is mounted to slash with real mount and things like that. We have a device file system mounted to that and in the, the environment that's uh, copied to that uh, path here. And then we have a standard command line that very much feels like Linux. So if you're doing Linux uh, usually um, and you're doing uh, bootloader stuff, then that, this will feel really familiar. From time to time you do things like type, typing boom or something like that. So, and the, sometimes one really forgets that this isn't the real Linux. Um, and you can do things like that as and see things here. And, uh, uh, if we have device nodes and that here, you can see this. 
And uh, one really important thing if you bring up hardware is that you are able to access them. Uh, look around, look into registers, try to find out what's going on, things like this. And what, what we are doing here is that, for example, there's this MD memory dump command here, and that usually works on that MEM. You can just look into the, the ROM root order of that MD processor here. And uh, if, if you don't want to access uh, the, the normal physical memory, you can also use one of the other drivers available, like uh, in this case here, one of the Ethernet files. And if you add uh, the word switch here for 16 bit access, you can see that you can just access the 16 bit, uh, 16 -bit um, word register um, this file. Uh, this is uh, pretty much debugging stuff, just to find out what's going on in the hardware and uh, well, to, to, to bring up new, new electronics. Um, one of the most interesting concepts is that if you have a tile system, you can just start copying things around. You don't need any special commands for that anymore. Remember fetching the kernel from somewhere and putting it somewhere somewhere else in some other address. When, when I work on a new boot, I, I just confused all these hex addresses yeah, where you had to copy the kernel to and all these things. And uh, all this becomes much easier. Like uh, if you look at, for example, this here, this is just copying from DevNet 0 to, uh, well, to somewhere. Um, in the file system, in the run file system, uh, and you can just say, I want to use this device, and you don't have to remember where this device was and what the correct has. It's quite comfortable. Um, it's also possible to add uh, partitions, like, uh, well, when your kernel starts, it usually needs some idea about how your flash is partitioned, not flash, and flash, all these things. And uh, we have an add part command in DevOps as well. And you can just uh, give it a string here, which uh, specifies layout of the partitions. And uh, and DevOps is able to access that. And it's exactly the same so that, like what the kernel needs. You, you can just take that over to the current command line and continue there. Quite comfortable as well. Um, another interesting concept is uh, device variables. For example, a device like uh, the first Ethernet device here can just have parameters. If you use the def info command here, you can uh, call def info ETH0. And then you see what the driver outputs for this device. And here you can see what the kind of parameters it has, like the IP address uh, and so on. And you can just uh, set it like a variable, like this here. So setting variables for devices is uh, quite easy. Also getting the kernel and IPFP, for example. Uh, recently, in DevOps, we are more going towards uh, having well things automatically mounted, so you can even copy things from the TFTP file system and things like that. So that's, that's all quite easy and it's very abstract if you compare it to our design for example. Okay. So this was basically a short introduction for those of you who are not familiar with, uh, with, with DevOps yet and uh, didn't work with the bootloader in the past, just to get a little bit of an impression of how it looks like. And uh, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, the free desktop of bootloader specification. And if we uh, remember this image here, where we actually started uh, the system here, came to the decision point, and then wanted to call into one of, of, of these, well, call it distributions or Linux systems, um, then we have, in fact, we have one problem. Um, when you have actually started the kernel, then it's quite clear how, how the next steps look like. But, uh, you can give a the root file system uh, variable to the Linux kernel command line and have a kernel where it finds the root file system and all these things are quite clear. Um, but at this point here, where you need to, to do things, where you need to find out uh, where your root file systems could be, there is something like a gap in the specifications because uh, when, when all these things came up, uh, hardware was quite fixed. There was no no big um, well hot, uh, hot clock, uh, buses like USB memory sticks or SD cards or anything like that. Uh, when U-Boot was written, you basically knew that you had uh, 
uh, some more flash or hand flash or something like that in, in your system, and there was nothing dynamic in that. Today, um, especially if you don't look at these deeply embedded uh, devices, but at things like MacBooks or more PC-like devices, then quite often you can just plug in an SD card and start from that, and you basically don't know anything about that. Uh, you, you, you want to look inside, you want to introspect that, and you want to find out what's in there. And this is basically something uh, where we have a, a gap in the specifications. Uh, we look around how the big distributions do that today, um, especially on, on different ARM targets. And for example, if you look at uh, how um, Ubuntu works on, for example, the x 53 Pixar board or the Panda board, uh, the Toshiba AC100 or um, OMAP3 Eagle board, then we find a lot of readme's or how to do this command, take this one, and then a lot of instructions you need to do in the right order, and in the end you get your system out of line. Basically the same if you look at uh, Debian on different uh, ARM systems, it's also more or less how to wear. Uh, you, you look into some VT, you, you, you collect your commands to do the right things, and then in the end it starts up, and when the kernel is up and running, then all the systems uh, feel almost uh, the same. Fedora, the same thing here. Uh, it's for every distribution, you, if you look out uh, on, on which ARM devices they are supported, you will find that uh, it's a completely different set. Yeah, one distribution has been tested by some people on, on uh, that hardware, and then the distribution on that other hardware, and they have written a how to, and, and then it is supported. But there's no generic way. Yeah, here is uh, where we have this little gap yeah, between bootloader and the kernel. And there's nothing which, which is unified in, in that area so far. Uh, so it's basically a manual process. As I told you, with a lot of reading and uh, in the end, the distribution do not have general ARM support for any board, which is readable, but just for select and ARM based boards. So some years ago, there was this nice commercial here in, in uh, German computer magazine. So, uh, some company, I can't read this here, uh, where some company said the open operating system doesn't only have one, it's, it's, it's all different, it can take, uh, well, strange parts here. So this is basically the situation we have today. We have a lot of interesting hardware here, we have a lot of uh, distributions here, and uh, for, for any of these, you need to, to define something uh, special. <coughs> This is where the free desktop or Google specification uh, comes in, and this tries to fill this gap and tries to invent something here, which is which, which can be supported uh, for all these devices and makes it possible to discover what is what's in here. I'll show you some examples in a little later. This is where you can find the Google uh, specification that's uh, coming from the startup people. Um, you know that Debian new system day or how is it called? I don't know. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> okay, uh, these people have invented that, and um, yeah, what, what it basically does is um, it offers a standard method how to find a partition to use as a tool, and it defines these bootloader entries, which contain a drop-in text file per entry, where you can just describe one of your operating system images you might have on your SD card. So let's, for example, just take a laptop with an SD card, something like that, uh, with different operating systems on, on, on the card, and uh, these entries define what's in there. And then you have, can have a directory here with a machine ID, and in there you have kernel and init ID, device tree, and so if you look at different hardware, this is what, what we currently care about, one of these uh, embedded boards from the history here, or another one, uh, the socket here for the FPGA or the video board, something like that. And you see that there's a completely different set of media, uh, EMFC here, NAND, SD card, card SD IDOR, or something like that. And what the Google does want to do is it wants to look inside, wants to find out what's in there, and wants to well either select one of those or use any algorithm uh, to choose between them. 
So I found out some find the root partition. Um, on MBR, this uh, looks for a special partition with uh, type ODXDA. And on GPT, it looks like uh, for this UID here. And if it finds that, we use that as uh, that root that looks for these entries. And the entries look like this one here. You basically just had a text file with a title, a version, a machine ID, options, Linux, init RB, and we added the device tree to the, to the specification. When you first write that on an embedded arm, the, the, this option wasn't available. We brought that into the, the spec recently. And this is basically everything the bootloader needs to know about uh, that boot target. And if you have this information, then well, that's basically all you need for one of the terminal slots I showed you on, on my first image over there. Okay, so what can you uh, do with, with a Google specification uh, when you have the system up and running? This is an example here from the famous uh, Cisco network, which is what, what one of the first ARM-based uh, networks within, I think, MX51 or something like that. Cortex A8 CPU in the 800 megahertz uh, range, the smart code. And if you have that up and running, you can use that uh, kernel install command here, which is coming from the system B uh, project. And you can, for example, just tell it that you want to install it up and running here. And if, if you just do that from your updater or whatever, or from your the package uh, manager, then it takes care of these bootloader entries, of these text files, and it provides everything the bootloader needs when you start it for the first time uh, to, uh, to have another entry with another kernel, for example. So this is also communication between the user space and uh, the early stage uh, where you have to write where you want to use that. Alright, so basically we have a simple configuration file, like if you remember perhaps when you got this in former times, and we have a system D support for bootloader spec with a prime install script. And so you can just install multiple distributions in parallel. You can, you can have Fedora and Debian and Ubuntu and whatever on, on one medium. And uh, you can even have multiple kernels of pair distributions and all that is just described uh, with a config file. Bootloader can then auto discover that. And uh, what, what we did with that was we had one uh, SD card and we plugged it into several, uh, well, completely different ARM CPU uh, based embedded devices. And it can just boot. Now remember if, uh, what, what, what the current community is doing right now. They are working on getting one unified kernel for ARM. Uh, we have all the decisions if you are on one model or another one. Uh, is basically done on runtime and not on compile time anymore, like the former times. And the combination of these two things make it really possible that we can have one SD card and plug it into different devices and just boots just by the different Alright. So we have a good understanding of these boot targets now. Uh, when we started with the Google spec, uh, it already worked on the SD cards of types which uh, are running on the X4 file system or in, in the embedded universe we quite often have uh, the VMCs which is basically an SD card uh, in a VGA case which you can already install that into your device. Um, that worked right out of the box, and what has been added uh, was open for the device tree support that the, the we can also describe our hardware uh, within our F tree and support for um, well, flash based devices, real, real flash based devices, power flash and um, flash based devices, and UBI FS. That was also what you have seen in my first demo uh, of the Unity device, which just has an flash and booted uh, from them. UBFS uh, partition. All right. The second thing which came in last year called uh, Airbox is support for the open device tree. 
Um, the open family bus tree is, at least in my opinion, thought differently if you had asked me some years ago, but in the meantime, I think it's, it's a very nice uh, well, tool or method to, to just describe part of it, to declare what you have in your embedded system, everything which is not also discoverable, like having certain chips on certain addresses on your address and data bus and these things. And uh, all that is done by a nice and accurate way in the open the device tree. And the more this is used in the kernel, the more we thought about that we, well, really need the same information in the bootloader space as well. Uh, in the bootloader, there are a lot of uh, points where you need to access some hardware, where you need to do some decisions uh, based on where the, the different, different devices in your hardware are and, uh, in order to initialize them. And what we did there basically was um, that we added uh, we found that device tree support also to Bearbox. So uh, you can in fact use the same device tree you use for your mainland channel and put it in Bearbox and then compile Bearbox with that and then it does all the initial hardware bring up from the device tree. Now it looks where all the devices are, which I2C devices are on your bus and which address and all these things and it starts the initialization from there. So from our point of view, uh, remember we are doing a lot of uh, Linux counterpart into new hardware. Uh, this made it a lot easier to, to bring up Linux on, on new boards. For example, uh, we have a lot of uh, well, hardware boards uh, we are working on with uh, the Freescale I don't family, for example. And if I remember how that worked, let's say two or three years ago, it was always a lot of low-level hacking, a lot of programming, writing word files and these things, pushing things through the compiler. And if you compare that to how that works these days, um, it's basically writing in the OF tree. So if you have written in the OF tree and have, have described your hardware, have uh, specified where all the devices are, when you're basically done, you just feed the device tree to the uh, bootloader, to Paradox, and it's well, and it moves. If you find everything right, of course. Okay, the same device tree can be used to start the kernel, so you can just hand that over from the bootloader to the kernel, works more or less automatically. Uh, there are other nice features in Bearbox, for example, that you can runtime patch the device tree. Uh, we sometimes have the case that uh, there are variants of the board, let's say it was 512 megabytes of RAM or with one gigabyte of RAM, and if you can't auto detect that, you can just, if you know that, you can just write a little runtime patch for the device tree and put that into Bearbox. Uh, and so you can just put it there, and then it loads the device tree, changes that entry to, to what you already know, and then handle it off to the kernel and start. It works quite nicely. Um, an interesting application for that is um, the declaration of displays. We have one embedded system which is often used uh, for the uh, for the displays for train stops and, and that uh, kind of applications. And what happens there is that if the display breaks and needs to be exchanged, and the technician goes goes up there and mounts a new display, and uh, well, he, he doesn't doesn't know much about software, right? He, he just knows how to screw the display into the case and all that. And what they are doing there is that they just put that device tree snippet with a new display description onto a USB stick. The technician just puts it in. That box just reads that description from the USB sticks and runtime patches that into the OF tree and starts over. And so the technician doesn't know, doesn't need to know anything but how to plug in the USB stick and get that description. Very nice and makes it quite easy to, to describe part of it. Um, there's a downside in that, and everybody who has known this device tree in the past probably knows that uh, device tree very much depends on the stability of the bindings. So since we have device tree based kernels, uh, one of the reasons, uh, oh, the most prominent reason why the board uh, refers to boot is that something changed in the device tree and some other component didn't take care of that. Um, the awareness for that 
grow quite a lot in the Kernel community recently. Uh, the Kernel developers are really, really taking care of not changing those device tree bindings. It doesn't work in any case, and uh, still a uh, reason for support and booting these days, but it has become much, much better than if you look like <laughs> All right, so other than these, um, for example, we have uh, multi-image support in DevOps here. Uh, with multi-image support, it's easily possible, this is what you read here, it's quite easy to build um, multiple images uh, from the same config. With the case that we have one DevOps configuration, remember that's just kconfig, we try to make menu config and then you can change things. And sometimes you have a whole family for different devices with different CPUs, you know, or quad core or a core or something like that, on a mix things, for example, or uh, well, works which are just a little bit different. Uh, then it's, it's possible, like with the kernel, you can switch on all the different variants in kconfig. And uh, the build system automatically builds a lot of uh, images out of that in one one. It makes it quite easier to have just one compiler one and to generate a lot of other things and so quite a lot more better uh, compiler coverage and, and that kind of things. And for these auto detectable uh, devices, there's a nice detect command now. So that on introspectable buses like USB or SD, we don't know before what was in there. And usually you have the situation that if you look on any boot, what's, what's on that USB uh, bus, for example, this needs quite a lot of time. If you want to achieve fast boot times, like in my video, uh, with five seconds up to the point where the application is running, then you usually can't probe all the possible buses, SD cards, and, and uh, USB uh, until then. And for example, in that case, I told you that, uh, with, the, with the train uh, this place, um, what it does there is it looks if a USB stick is connected, and only if it is connected, it uh, runs detect and looks what's in there and tries to do something. And, all the, the protocol level initialization kind of things. So that's also quite nice. Uh, and we can, for development quite nice, you can mount all the devices at once with mount minus A. And uh, this is quite new. This is uh, an excerpt from the Pangatronics uh, internal IRC from Friday evening, Friday night, now Friday evening here. And um, where one of the colleagues here is uh, working on, on this uh, television uh, BBT uh, device with an MX27 uh, CPU on it, uh, which just uh, has a television receiver on one side, a network on the other side, and you can stream uh, television to the local network. And uh, on this device, he's, he's working on NFS version 3 support uh, in DevOps. And as you can see here, you can uh, have a look at uh, the file system on the server here. And NFS version 3 is pretty important for us because if we have that, we can basically get rid of uh, the requirement to have a TFTP server for development. I mean, if, if you're doing uh, good early development, in, in most cases you will probably have a TFTP server running, right? Because uh, you need to fetch your kernel from somewhere. And uh, if, uh, you can do the same thing with NFS. And the interesting thing there is that you can uh, use user space in the FS daemon and you don't need to install anything on, on the development machine anymore. Uh, installing things in the development machine is usually something where you need, you need to do a lot of things correctly and uh, choose the right TFTP daemon that's not an easy task sometimes. There are so many different ones with different drugs and different features. And uh, we try to get rid of that. And uh, well, we are also working with PDXs that uh, cross build system and PDXs we have a feature where we can just uh, run a command and then expose our root file system via NFS root. And now we can also uh, expose the kernel via NFS version 3, all from user space without needing root access. And then the root can, uh, the board can boot up and uh, do more things. So it's quite new to the today's storage, not, not even in the repositories yet. And I think quite an interesting thing, which makes uh, development a lot easier. All right, so if you want to try that, uh, here's uh, the most important uh, communication channel. You can go to the website, uh, www.demos.org, uh, IRC, IRC channel, and uh, Freenode. And uh, we have um, this mailing list here, which is the main communication channel, basically.
basically where you can send your patches with the kit tree and all that. You can find that uh, on the web as well. All right, that, that's my talk. Thanks for coming. Do you have questions? Okay, I see. I've seen that you have also firmware update support in Bearbox. Could you elaborate on that? Um, firmware update in, in which sense? I mean, writing a kernel into some. I know, I've just seen a menu option in the configure yeah. menu of Bearbox, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what you mean. Maybe it's just something that we can update later on. Yeah, look at, at the sources. Maybe for FPGA. Any, any idea of your market share? I mean, your competition is essentially uh, U-Boot. And uh, do you have any idea on how many of those boards are choosing one or the other project? Um, well, basically the thing is that uh, we don't really see that as competition. I mean, it's all open source software. And for us, one of the most important uh, well, things behind doing this is getting more problems solved. Uh, so we usually look at what other projects are doing. We are looking at what Ubud is doing. We are looking at what the kernel is doing uh, from time to time. I mean, that's a nice thing to open source. You can just look what other people are doing, just take something from there, port it over to your uh, environment, and uh, the other way around. Uh, I, I don't see this as a conference situation or something like that. It's just all this, this vibrant open source community and where you can, well, not, not invent everything from scratch, but, um, well, a lot of this wouldn't have been possible without you would be there. Um, I think that Sasha Hauer, who is the maintainer of Bearbox, has already looked at what's possible there. And there are also ideas like, uh, no, I don't say anything. <laughs> there are also some ideas how to implement that in, in all the interfaces uh, in, in Bearbox, uh, but it's not there already. But uh, it should be possible in some or the other way. Well, we, we continuously look around what's going on there. And, Basically, the idea behind all that is being able to reveal you know, somehow. Uh, the Linux universe is changing over the time, and also the methods, how uh, the bootloader and the current interaction is changing. And we, we, we don't really know what will happen during the next uh, years. You know, there's all these heated uh, discussion about ACPI on one side and UEFI and uh, doing QDF value text on the other side and doing more F3 and this kind of thing. Uh, uh, I think it's, it's quite interesting to observe all that. And in the end, uh, what, what we need to do is to make them as good on the hardware. And whatever is necessary needs to be done with the open source components and what's there. Um, so you mentioned at the beginning of the talk that you introduced um, some modern programming uh, um, ideas into, into the bootloader, uh, more specifically the, I, I don't know whether I remember it right, but uh, you have some kind of driver model for, um, for the yeah. So um, assuming there's this Linux kernel driver I would like to have in the bootloader bootloader for whatever reason, what's your belly feeling? How hard would it be to, to pour the Linux kernel driver to the bootloader? I didn't understand the last part. How hard would it be to port a Linux kernel driver ah, okay. to Google? Yeah, uh, in, in general that's pretty easy. Um, in fact, uh, the driver model in Bearbox looks quite similar to what the kernel has. I mean, it was entire, uh, inspired from there. And what you basically need to do is you need to get rid of all the parallel execution stuff. Now, we don't have interrupts in Bearbox. I mean, it's still the bootloader. Yeah. Although we have all those nice fancy things. And if you, it's, it's, uh, in some way, it's like uh, if you look at Linux looks, well, back in the 2.4 days or something like that, where you didn't have SMP and, and these 
kind of things. Uh, so that's basically taking a driver from the kernel that you really need to, uh, well, making it easier, remove the uh, parallelism, and then put it, you know, so it works quite nicely. Uh, in fact, we don't really like this. Yeah, because it's code application in the end, and we don't like code application like anyone else is working with that. But uh, if, if you look at my use cases with, with all these uh, fallback images and things like, things like that, that basically doesn't work without any instance which takes care about that decision point or the algorithms how to choose which partition and how to choose which filters. Uh, so this is basically what, what still drives uh, that we think you need a bootloader even today. Uh, and things like just starting the kernel is, is no real option for, for most cases. There are other uh, use cases where this is an option. But uh, there are a lot of really good use cases out there with real devices where it uh, really doesn't work. Thanks. Other questions? Okay, then thanks for being here. And if you have other questions, you might also come.